Welcome to the Wiggly Podcast, the first of the new year. Happy New Year from Heather at Wiggly Wigglers. Yeah, happy New Year from me too. Seasons felicitations from myself. <laughs> Seasons what, to Phil? Go over the top. I can't spell it, Rich, so don't worry. <laughs> happy New Year, mate. Happy New Year. Now, we have to crack on with this podcast because <clears throat> Farmer Phil is going for some maintenance. Really? <laughs> yes. He's taking, he's having a village trip out to the doctor's. And it's all in aid of our pool team. You know we play pool yeah. every Thursday night when yeah. tonight is pool. Okay. And they've promised me that before the new year they would get these issues sorted. Right. And that is that the whole of our pool team is blind and deaf. Yeah. And so this is it just an age thing they have. Is it just a you know, natural deterioration in, in uh, you know, physique? Yes. Yeah. But uh, that doesn't stop a little bit maintenance taking place. The worrying thing, no, no, well, the worrying right. thing More is, is required, that, I guess. that Heather has spent the last six weeks supervising and uh, indulging in maintenance of, of the house. And so that, you know, we've sort of done quite a lot and a bit of painting and this, that and the other and smartened the place up. <laughs> and now she's <laughs> cast her eyes in my direction. And so I, it's not gone beyond my notice that there is a Facebook group entitled something along the lines of Smart and Farmer Fill Up. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, so now, now he's I've had been a haircut. dispatched to the vets to have my ears investigated because I don't hear very well. Yeah, he's mm-hmm. had a haircut and so have I. Yes, you've both had haircuts. <laughs> <laughs> now what do you think of mine, Rich? Well, I thought, it, you know, because sometimes when I see you and you're looking smart and relatively attractive, I say, oh, have you looked really nice today? Would and like it, would be a shame, it? it would be a shame to, you know, to, to just say it as a matter of course. Of course. Which I, I feel so, you ought to qualify so, the word So yesterday I walked into the office and I saw Hev after her new, new, uh, new hair job and I, I thought, there you are. <laughs> you've, had a, you've had your hair done. <laughs> But I thought you, you looked, uh, looked just like the, the lion from The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> I could see you skipping down there with a the tin, skipping along the yellow brick lane with the tin man, <laughs> cowering with your little tail waggling away. It's so, the uh, Kate Humble look. Yeah, it is the Kate Humble look. <laughs> but Kate Humble is, is five foot ten and... <laughs> You know, and she's got a personal trainer and all this kind of thing, which predisposes a whole different kind of demeanour. Moving on. And it, <laughs> Keep digging, Rich. But Phil's hair looks so much better. <laughs> he, he has, he's just lost that public schoolboy mop. That's, that's much, much better, I think. So much more in keeping. And I think more frequent trips for the hairdresser for Phil is the way forward. Time for the music. <laughs> End. I was going to get onto the subject of the relative <laughs> cost. On this week's show, we have Farmer Phil meets Muddy Matches. We've got Planning Your Veggie Garden, which is an extensive article with lots of research done by Ricardo. Mm. And we've got Jodie Sprouter in... (laughs) Good (laughs) Lord. (laughs) But first of all, let's hear back from Louise Beacon. Do you remember we sent out the birthday message when I accidentally called her husband's tractor a bike? Yes. Yes. Well, she sent back, she said, Hi, Heather. Mark loved his birthday shout-out, and apparently his mates at work call it a bike, too. (laughs) (laughs) We'd also love for Ricardo to come down to interview for the podcast. Tell him there's plenty of cider in Devon, too. All the best for 2008. We'll keep you updated as we tackle the battlefield of weeds and brambles. And that's from Louise. We also find out about bergamot. Do you remember we asked what bergamot was in Earl Grey tea? Mm. Well, somebody has let us know. What is it? I'm not going to say. Uh. <laughs> not yet. That's my catch. Okay. So that you keep listening till the end of the show. Oh, I see. And we're on Facebook. Now there's 85 fantastic topics. Yep. And one on cats. I did make a New Year's, New Year's resolution that I wouldn't go back to the cat topic now. My final contribution was made... Uh, on Friday last. Brilliant. I shall put something up then. 
It's always best to have the last say, isn't it? Yeah, I don't think I've got the last say. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. Oh, I see, oh, I see. All oh, right, OK. OK, then tell us about this veggie patch. Well, I suppose it's the time of year, isn't it? Rach said yesterday, um, and I think you asked, you said, oh, Rich, could you just write me a little thing about planning your veggie patch for this ensuing spring and summer? And I thought, no, yeah, actually, it's something I perhaps need to get my head around and think about our veggie patch at home. It's quite important, really. It's been important to have a good crop rotation in the vegetable patch. There are certain things like runner beans, for instance, that you can plant in the same place. And because the nodules on their roots fix the nitrogen in the soil, it's quite a good idea to keep runner beans in the same place. And lots of people have bean trenches anyway, so you're constantly filling up that space with organic matter and filling it with soil and then growing your beans in there. Uh, but generally speaking, it's a good idea to, to rotate all your crops. I mean, it, there are instances where I've got a neighbour, for instance, that has he's had the same onion patch for 15 years and has never suffered, never had any problems, never had any disease infestations on his onions. But I would always say try and rotate them, you know, it's absolutely fine. So if you're setting up your vegetable patch for the first time, is the best thing to do have four raised beds then? Raised beds are good because a vegetable patch is always good that you don't have to walk over, you don't compact the soil, therefore you don't have to dig it very much and you can really minimise the tillage. Raised beds are also good because they're easy to get at. You know, you can quite literally kneel on the side of one and, and excavate a, a salad or a carrot or whatever you've got implanted in there. Oh. I'm just chewing on the idea of excavating my salad. I thought he was going to say he was going to excavate a leaf. Excavate which is what I was doing last Yeah, week. yeah. Recently, I've walked up into the garden and I've been thinking about things to do. I've looked at the ryegrass, which really needs digging in now. There's an interesting one. You know, some people dig it in a, a, a couple of months ago, but the, my idea of ryegrass, any, any um, green manure, is, is that they hold the nitrate. You know, they fix it. And then, consequently, when you dig them in and you give them enough time to rot down into the soil before you plant the next crop, then that saves leaching any nutrients over the winter time. So if you dig them in too early, so if you dug them back in, I don't know, you know, November time, which some people do for, for whatever reason, then you're losing all that fixing of the nutrients. So what I shall do is I'll dig in my green manures probably at the end of this month, beginning of February, and that'll give me enough time for all that lovely grass, essentially, to rot down into soil so you get a nice friable substrate. And I've noticed I've got millions of moles in the rye gra- voles rather in the in the rye grass this year, which is which is going to be interesting. So I'm, I'm going to excavate a few of those guys in the process of digging them up. My kestrel's not taking a, a sufficient toll. So are voles good or bad? Uh, uh, they're, they're, they're probably uh, a, a bit bad in some respects. They're good in the sense that you get lots of owls and kestrels, and you can sit there in the garden and watch little voles twittering around. You can hear them squeak and things like that. So that's quite nice. But they do have impacts in the, in the veggie patch. For instance, I would have saved a load of broad bean seed last year, <laughs> but I couldn't because the blinking voles kept eating my broad beans. So I had to pick them all when I had a chance to. I thought, well, I'm not leaving them for the voles to eat, so I picked them all and dore them. So I haven't been able to store any um, any broad bean seed. I mean, it's an interesting one, storing seed. I've got, I've got some fantastic seed uh, that I have saved, some runner beans, big, juicy runner beans. And they're dead easy. But you can leave them on the, on the vines to dry and pick them off and then crack the pods and you get all these beautifully dried beans. Save those over the summer and squash seeds as well. You know, all your kind of marrow seeds and your butternut squashes and even cucumber seed you could you can save, things like that. A lot of the heritage seeds, a lot of organic seed that haven't been adulterated in any way, you know, are quite easily dried out in store. You've got some views on organic seed, haven't you, Farmer Phil? Uh, Being a farmer who grows for seed, <coughs> it's a, who it's says, an interesting subject. I'll have an evening, <laughs> organic seed is impossible and, and uh, what a ridiculous thing. The, the reason being on, a, in a, on an agricultural scale is that there are protocols to do with the purity of the seed stock and the inspection of it which mean that you have to grow it to a standard. And that's perfectly reasonable, so that when somebody else buys the result of your labours, that they know what they're getting. But the protocols of the Soil Association particularly say that if you're growing an organic crop, you should use organically grown seed. Hmm. And growing seed organically on a field scale is quite a difficult thing because of the weeds and rubbish that tends to grow in amongst it, which makes it very difficult to establish whether it's pure or not. So then what happens is that it would appear that there there is a shortage of organic seed and so they apply for a derogation to use normal seed, which they're given, obviously, because otherwise there wouldn't be enough seed. But I'm not sure in my mind that if you grow a plant conventionally and then multiply the the seed on 
afterwards, does whether it's grown organically or not have the slightest effect? I, I would suggest probably not. I don't know, you see. The problem is I don't know enough about it. I mean, I wish I could... Uh, but there must be... We, That's I mean, we, never we, stopped we, you we before. <laughs> we supply, Good Lord. We supply organic seed, and, and Pippa obviously kind of grows this, this organic seed for us. It's fantastic stuff, and there are you know, a whole host of organic farmers which would argue with you vociferously, I think, if they were in a position to do so. Well, I think be, their, their problem think is that the, the cost of the organic... It's slightly more complicated and perhaps more, slightly more labour-intensive, but on balance, isn't that quite worthy? I think it probably is worthy, but it, the difficulty is that on a field scale, so for me as a grass seed grower, trying to grow organic grass seed is a very difficult thing because mm. of the grass weeds that come up in it, which cause, you know, absolute nightmare. Oh, I'm glad we've got to the bottom of it. He's lazy. Moving <laughs> on. <laughs> <laughs> you cut off in your prime again there, Phil. Yeah, it's obviously that you know, don't, farmers don't want don't to do difficult yeah. things. Did you not think, Richard, it was farmers' wifely duties to go out with the old hoe and hoe 50 acres of grass seed every so often? I did, uh, moving absolutely. On. <laughs> At least your, your new hairstyle will keep you warm when you're doing it. <laughs> should probably blow over. <laughs> Some of us are trying to be like Kate Humble. If only you could be a little more like Bill Oddie and have a bit of knowledge, we'd all be fine. Yeah, but wouldn't there we? is a problem there, isn't there? Because <laughs> one of you's five foot tall, trying to be somebody who's yes, five so. foot ten. The other one's six foot <laughs> tall, trying to be somebody who's yeah. five foot <laughs> tall. Maybe I'll <laughs> just go for the to... Bill Oddie look then. I, mean, yeah, I, think, I think we should, <laughs> we should just change the genders. It'd be so much easier. <laughs> If Rich grew his hair a bit more, I mean, I suppose at a distance we could pass him off as Kate Humble, wouldn't we? <laughs> That's not us. Um, I'll take that as a compliment, Phil. Right, uh, what I want to know about is Jodie's Sprouter. But first, let's hear, Phil, about the day that you tried out Muddy Matches. I did, didn't I? Yes. They, they, this house arrived on the drive. <laughs> did. And I, I came down the yard, <laughs> there's, there's a house. And they go on tour, these, these two girls from Lincolnshire, aren't they, they, they come from? Mm-hmm. And they go on tour from time to time in this camper van, which is painted out like a cottage. So we'll put a picture up on the so blog. The, we've got pictures of it, but it, it, it looks like a country cottage on wheels. Right. And they drive this thing, and they've, they've gone on tour for, I think, three months, haven't they, all over the country. Yeah. Going to different events and venues and so on. So farming. They, they've done everything related. from farming shows to hunt balls to fat stock shows, everything. And they live in this thing and they're promoting Muddy Matches, which is a friendship stroke dating agency oh. for country folk. Right. <laughs> and so they and Heather thought it would be a great idea for Farmer Phil to take their How Muddy Are You quiz. OK. So let's hear a a little snippet of Farmer Phil taking the test. An occurrence has occurred. A van has turned up which apparently looks like a cottage with all flowers on the outside and two ladies have got out and they're called Muddy Matches. (laughs) And so welcome to Emma and Lucy to the Wiggly podcast. Thank Um, you very much. To the Wiggly sofa. (laughs) And we also have Farmer Phil with us. The new Wiggly sofa. Yes, but we'll go into that at some other point. <laughs> Tell me about your business, Muddy Matches. Well, we set up a website in March for country people. It's an online community for country-minded, or muddy, we call them, people. And it's a way to meet like-minded people. And people do it for dating, or if they've just moved to a new area and want to meet some new people. And so you rate them muddy or towny? It's a sliding scale of muddiness and towniness. Very few people who are all or nothing. You've always got a bit of town in you and a bit of country in you. How Most muddy people. are you? I'm 70 30, but there's like 10, I can't remember how many questions there are, but there's questions, tongue in cheek questions that you answer and it's uh, very accurate actually on giving you your muddy to towny ratio. Okay, so let's go and do the muddy ratio for Farmer Phil. Brilliant, <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> he should come out quite highly. And um, Father Phil, when you first came to the village... Yeah, because of course I am an incomer. Yes, you've only been in the village for how many years? Um, more than 25. Yes, so obviously you're new. <laughs> um, tell us about what you did, because Muddy Matches wasn't available then. Well, it was quite interesting actually, because when, when Emma and Lucy turned up, it reminded me of the fact that when I came here, I'd just come out of <clears throat> university, so I was sort of early 20s, and I didn't know anybody. 
and my family are not sort of pub type people they're quite happy existing within their own space ah. but I remember it took me weeks to pluck up enough courage to actually go to the pub and go through the door and it was one of the most daunting things imaginable and of course you know once I got through the door the rest is history but <laughs> it, so I remember mu- that feeling. So Muddy Match isn't just for people who want love no it can be people who've moved into an area and perhaps want a bit of more muddy content yeah, just, it's just a way of meeting people, really. Oh, I think it's all about love, really. <laughs> it's called Muddy because uh, we've thought about all the um, things that country people do, and so many people do different things, but the one thing that unites all country people is mud. So Muddy Match is about not having an aversion to mud. It's quite similar to us, really, because we're called Wiggly Wigglers because everything starts at the soil. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there we are. Right, okay. Another measure of muddiness would be what type of wellies you use we do have you can in appearance text i think it is we have pointers for people to write stuff in their profile and one of them is about what wellies you would wear and everybody answers it's so funny so newcomers to the site who haven't filled out a profile wonder why everybody talks about their wellies (laughs) that's why (laughs) right now because my voice isn't quite as refined as your two uh, I'm going to get you two to ask the questions and then Farmer Phil to fill in the answer so uh, you'll ask the questions I'll give the options Farmer Phil will give the answer okay. over to Emma to start question one where would your ideal house be option one in a village a five minute walk from open fields with a bus once a week Two, in a town to be close to the shops but a short drive from the countryside or park. Three, in a remote area surrounded by woods, fields and a stretch of river. Uh, Four, in a city to be close by to the happening nightlife and extensive public transport. (laughs) Farmer Phil, what is your answer? Could it be (laughs) C? I might aspire to D (laughs) because of my trendy, cool nature and my well-known fashion sense. It's got to be C, really. So you don't want to live in a village? No, I prefer living not quite in a village. Okay. And over now to the second question from Lucy. What are the usual contents of your vacuum cleaner? Option A, 20% house dust, 80% unidentifiable mixture of animal hair, (laughs) feathers and mud. (laughs) B, 60% house dust, 40% mud and cat, dog, horse hair. C, 80% house dust, 20% mud and cat and dog hair. D, 90% house dust, 10% glitter from last night's clubbing. (laughs) Um, it's A, isn't it? Well, it's worse than A, maybe, isn't it? <laughs> so over to Emma for question three. What items mostly take up your wardrobe? <sighs> <laughs> A, designer suits and trendy labels. Absolutely. I think not, dear listener. <laughs> B, fleeces and jeans in various states of disrepair. Oh, and a few work clothes. C, mainly smart casual clothing with a smattering of outdoor gear. D. Boiler suits, check shirts, holy jumpers, cords and tweed for best. (laughs) (laughs) No comment. Okay, so it's really, actually it's B rather than D. It probably is more B. Yeah, because you haven't got any boiler suits and I've always encouraged you to wear tweed, but you refuse. (laughs) Okay, Lucy's on question four. Oh, that's a silly one. It's 5.30pm on Sunday. You've just got home, but you've run out of milk. Do you? A. Nip round the corner to the 24-hour shop. B. Drive 10 miles to the nearest open petrol station. C. Go out to the shed and milk the cow. D. Wait for the milkman to deliver it early in the morning. Farmer Phil. (laughs) Is it E. Send Heather to Madly Shop. I think he's probably send Heather to Madly Shop. It's yeah. not because we don't have milking cows. I, I think don't think even I would go and try and retrieve some from my cows. You'd so. go to Lock's Garage, ten miles away. I probably would, yeah. Okay, next question. Question five. What's your normal route to work? We don't even need to read out those options. It's out the back door and into the barn. <laughs> a. <laughs> Lucy, question six. What would be a typical holiday in the UK? A. A city break with your best friend to Manchester to check out the talent and the clubs. <laughs> I don't think so, chubby. Well, not that you know about it, <laughs> B. A group of you helping out your mate with the lambing on his remote sheep farm. 
not out. <laughs> See, going Munro bagging with just a bivy bag, map and compass. That sounds like exercise, so I don't <laughs> think we'll be Is that Marilyn Munro? <laughs> Munro's. They're mountains over a certain height. I can't remember what the height is then. <laughs> oh, sorry, I thought Death they were Marilyn Monroe. I thought, <laughs> they, were, not. I thought they were shock absorbers. <laughs> OK, D. Braving the elements to enjoy an action-packed week engaged in as many country pursuits activities as possible. I don't think you can answer that because yours is E going to the pub and lying down with the paper. <laughs> yeah, I think that would be fair comment. So the nearest to that is... What happens if we don't answer one, Lucy? You have to answer, unfortunately, otherwise you can't get your results. We'll lie and put an action-packed weekend. <laughs> <laughs> OK, next question, please. When walking on the moors, the fog starts to come down and you are lost. Do you... A. Try and position yourself as a compass and then, when that fails, start digging a hole to bed down for the night. B. Follow a stream downhill to get back to the valley. From there you can probably find a road. Or better still, a pub. C. Head for the highest point where you should get a better reception on your mobile phone to call for help. And Or D. I wouldn't be there in the first place. Definitely B. It's definitely D, Phil. It's not. <laughs> you would not be walking on the moors. I have done in the past. OK, I'll give you B. Next question, please. How much time do you spend in a town? A. As little as possible, although it's where I shop for food and DIY items. <laughs> B. Quite a lot, mainly because that's where I work. See, most of it, my body has now become dependent on traffic fumes. <laughs> D, I'll only go if I'm rushed unconscious to A and E. Uh, D. OK. OK, next question. Planning a night out, do you? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not an option. Oh, dear. It's A. Go for the early doors at the village pub. Just to check out, nothing's changed. That's a bit harsh. It's true. It and is. the last question. How often do you wear wellies? Well, that's quite interesting because in my case... It's Just a minute, the options, <laughs> I'm on. Well, well, options or not. A, I practically live in them. B, on weekend jaunts and holidays. C, I might just dust them off for a festival. D, when it's wet, although brand name is important. It's for holidays, isn't it? Because <laughs> he wears rigors and he wears, um, what do they call? Walking, Walking boots. boots. I think it's A because uh, it's still out in the mud. Well, it's just like Ah, OK. Yeah. All right. Outdoor yeah. footwear. Yeah. OK, dear listener, the tension has mounted. We're about to press the button and find out how muddy is Farmer Phil. I'm going to bet on 80 80% muddy, 20% tiny. Your bets, please, darlings. I'm going to say 90-10. Really? And she's an expert. Lucy? 70-30. OK. Oh, obviously somebody recognises my cosmopolitan <laughs> side. Farmer Phil, how muddy do you think you are? Now, looking at the state of me, pretty muddy, I should think. Oh, here it comes. Here <laughs> it comes. He is 80-20. And the result is... The muddy lifestyle mainly sustains you, but you can't avoid the town for a couple of essentials. <laughs> Thank you so much for no coming. Problem. And um, how do people get to your website to get their muddy match? It's www.muddymatches.co.uk. Fantastic. And they're going to send us in a tip yeah. for our catalogue. You have to look out for us on the road and hoot if you see us in our van. Yes, they look, it's unmistakable. <laughs> they are a country cottage dressed as a van. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. There you are. You can't say we don't have variety on the Wiggly podcast from last week's <laughs> wonderful Roy Strong. Sir Roy Strong. Did you like that? I really enjoyed that. Did you that. listen to the whole thing? Over to Muddy Matches. I've listened to it. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Mm. A lovely tour while I was making apple pie. Oh, all right. That's yeah. quite nice then. It was mm. very nice. And I have to say that it was her best apple pie yet. Really? And I don't know whether it was relevant, but she'd lost a recipe, so she was f sort of <laughs> <laughs> flying free, as it were, <laughs> on the old cooker. But the result was grand. And there's a picture up on the blog of me in full apple pie mode, because obviously there's a lot of flour involved. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly for Pod Chef's benefit. Yeah, yeah. To see what he has inspired. Now, yeah. before we go on to Jody Sprouter, what I need to know is what to plant now. 
Okay, right. Well, it's a good time to sow your onion seed and do so in, in a propagator in the windowsill. If you don't want to buy a propagator or anything like that, then uh, get yourself a seed tray and get a big plastic bag and cover your, your seed tray in a big plastic bag just as sufficient warmth for the seeds to germinate. What about air? You need a few little air holes in the bag. Good job I mentioned that yeah, one. Yeah, and I'll propagate all sorts of things like that. Really, you know, garlic cloves, they could go in now. Some people do it around sort of Christmas time and whatnot, but you can pop your garlic cloves in there now. Um, Mine have started to sprout in, are my, they? in my holder. Okay, garlic. they're just old. It could do. Yeah, they do. They will sprout. I mean, they're incredibly robust. I leave my cloves out the whole winter that I'm going to plant because they're, if they're subjected to really cold conditions. They do better. You know, they form cloves better. So do you just use the ones you've bought from the supermarket or do you buy well, again, garlic cloves to plant? Yeah, again, I thought I would suggest buying uh, garlic cloves to plant. It all depends on, the, on whether they've been hybridised or not. So hybridised plants very, very really come true. So, it, you know, you're better off buying, getting a, either an organic plant or, you know, something official from a, a, a seed supplier. Hybridised seed very often won't grow at all, will it? You know, no, no, you no, that's seed right. From it doesn't, doesn't do plant, it, it very often won't grow. Yeah. And brassicas, am I ready for those? At the moment we're eating, scoffing on loads of Brussels sprouts in the garden. We've had some nice sprout tops. Um, and these were things that went in the garden back in, what would it be, about August, I suppose, July, August time, something like that. But you can harvest sprouts much earlier, depending on when you put them in. Purple sprouting, well, that'll be ready for harvesting in March. I think there are varieties. There are different varieties as well that you can, you can harvest throughout the season. And, uh, and, of course, spring cabbage, spring greens. And they're hearting up now, so they'll be ready for feasting on within the next couple of weeks, I'm hoping. Well, the Wiggly Garden, we don't seem to have anything. We've had all the leeks. Yeah. So are you going to oh, okay. inspire some change in the Wiggly Garden this year? Because yeah, I think, well, I think is the moment here they... to start planting something? Because it seems sad. The, gar- the garlic can go in. The rye grass we've can had go in. Chard. Definitely. And yeah, I don't really like chard. I'm sick of it's chard. Good chard's good in, uh, it's very good for you. It's very good in fish pies and things like that. Maybe so. But, but, but brusque is a good for, for, for Phil. Week, but that didn't go much. Didn't <laughs> like we should ask Hannah to plant some purple sprite in and some uh, broccoli and things for Phil. It's very good for prostate cancer. Or avoiding prostate cancers for blokes. So those are deaths, uh, you know. So that's uh, oh, he's maintenance carcinogenic issue. Uh, veggies. I've never felt Great. so maintained. I mean, all veggies <laughs> are like that, but you know, it's a good thing to have uh, for, for fellows. I mean, again, and tomatoes and things are also brilliant uh, anti carcinogens. It is so nice to know. But, uh, so that you both care so much. Yeah, yeah. To look well, after you are, me. you know, you are sort of, you know, just getting on a bit now. And, uh, and the new year has started, so we should consider all these kind of. If you're going for your ears syringe, then there's no reason why we shouldn't. There's no plant way for your we're going well. to other places. That prostate <laughs> business stuff that frigging the marbles. Oh, what fun! Uh, yeah. Uh, right. Um, so yes, yeah, so are you going to inspire a new yes. Wiggly Garden? Yes, yes. Well, we, 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 we had, well, it was just that hiccup, wasn't it, this year, with the, yeah. with the, with the gardening thing. But um, I feel because, if we're supposed uh, to be planting sort of chopped, things, maybe chopped. now is the moment then. There are some things that... Uh, because uh, Broad bean seed, that can go in February time. And broad bean's good because you can get it in... I love broad beans. And they're beautiful, aren't they, with butter and stuff like that. Do you need to, when you save your seed, mm. do something to establish that it's viable? before you commit to planting it well, in the garden. Yeah, I mean if it's space is a, if a space is at a premium, I mean a great way to treat broad beans is quite literally to put them in a, a bag with some compost and shake them up, tie them off and then just leave them sprout in that bag and then you can just plant out the ones that have sprouted and then mm. you know that yeah, because I, I was, I was a bit concerned space. with the quality of some of the broad bean seed that you were fonding earlier on. Okay, <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, so that's a good. Th- I mean, actually, in most instances, that's a good thing to do. If you can be bothered to do that, it's quite a good idea to sow your seed first, let it germinate, and then plant out what's what's. It's uh, not very good for the soil, is growing. it? You, you prepare your seed bed and plant it, yeah. and then have a crop failure. For something as yeah, as well, that's it, and that's on. another thing, isn't it? And then it? you've and lost the soil structure to to prepare it again. It's never quite as good, is it? It's all yeah, no, not at all. And, and it is, and, and carrots and parsnips are especially vulnerable to those kind of failures. And it's so disappointing when the things don't germinate. And that is again, is it something that people should be conscious of? Is don't try and sow seed in the ground too early. Don't be in too much of a rush to do it because. Often people will say, oh, we'll get your carrot seed in, you know, March or something like that, early April. Well, just be careful because if we have a deluge of snow in middle of April, which we could do, and the soil stays cold and moist, then the seeds just rot on the ground. So I would say don't be in too much of a rush to sow outside, you know, let the soil get become warm 
and moist. Presumably, if you're using things like it. cloches, you can protect yourself a bit from those sort of early frosts. You can. I mean, cloches obviously help to maintain the soil warmth. But I would say, for the sake of ease, don't worry about it. You're still going to get your harvest, albeit a little bit later, if you're not sowing right early on in the year. Uh, but things like broad beans, it's quite important to get those in the ground because, of course, you can get a second, once you've harvested your broad beans, then you can plant all your brassicas where your broad beans have been. You can get a, get a second crop off that ground. Time for a Monty farm cast before we find out about this wonderful sprouter. Monty cast, a weekly fact on farming. A calf weighs about 80 pounds at birth. Another Monty cast, a weekly fact on farming, next week. Right, Rich, tell us about this sprouter. Oh, it's a great thing, isn't it, really? Because it, most people's sprouters are fairly unimaginative kind of plastic affairs, but this is um, it's, it's, a, it's a great terracotta tear. It almost looks like some kind of miniature statue. So Jodie has started off all these little seeds. That one's alfalfa. Okay. The next uh, one down is red clover, and the bottom one is fenugreek. Fenugreek. This is amazing. I mean, a lot of these things you could you can use as a as a, a green manure in the garden in the vegetable patch. But obviously, they're so nutritious that uh, it, it's a shame to not to uh, to grow them and feast on the on the newly hatched sprouts. I've just tried a bit of that. Yeah, what's it like? It's all right. Very good for you, I suppose. The interesting about this spriter is that the, this has got the little, well, little pores in the bottom of each tray. And there's no medium. You know, when I, I remember as a kid growing crescent mustard and things like that, and you put a, a little bit Locked of cotton paper. wool or something like that, yeah, just something that would absorb water, mm. and you sow your seed on there, and, and away to go. Um, whereas with this, you don't need to. But I think what you have to do with this is occasionally sort of mist spray it just so that there's uh, sufficient moisture retained in the bottom of these little terracotta trays. It's a groovy little thing though, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So all these seeds sound to me like they're green manures. Yeah, they, they, well, they can be used as uh, green manures, that's, that's the irony. I mean, fenugreek, for instance, a nutrition level of high in vitamin A and C, iron and phosphorus, lymph, blood, kidney, tonic. So there Gosh. you are. So it's good. So these are great. Uh, something like this, I reckon, would be really handy to sit, put on your windowsill. And when ingredients for sandwiches are a bit low, you can mix some of your fenugreek sprouters with your cheddar cheese and the sandwiches. They're beautiful, gorgeous. But how long can you keep them for? Because won't you just be eating sprouts the whole time? Yeah, I think uh, you might get bored of sprouts. You know, it's a bit like uh, the sandwich maker, isn't it? I think you it's have a for spell a while of it. And you, yeah, yeah, and I wonder whether that that's, uh, might be similar. We've got red, red clover here as well as a sprout. Yeah, but and the sandwich alfalfa. maker is a very good example because you forget about it for six months and then you get it out and go, oh, yeah, wow, yeah, toasted yeah, sandwiches. Yeah, so wonderful. maybe you do that with this. I think what's interesting about this kind of food, though, that I've found is that when you eat this sort of stuff and start to enjoy it and get a flavour for it, because the flavours are so clean and crisp and healthy, you enjoy it so much more, doesn't it? It's almost as though you, you feel better off the back of a diet that has these kind of contributions. Mm, I can imagine that with a bit of cheese. I really can. We're tasting. Are we supposed to be tasting? No, we're banned. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think these are, quite, these are quite ready yet, are they? They've got a bit of mileage in them. Are they? I think they're probably about, I don't know, three days off being completely finished before they can be... I mean, you could eat them now. Well, of course you could. You could eat the seeds if you wanted to, but you're going to get much from them. Right, tasty. So, obviously, Joe's put all three different varieties in this sprouter, which, again, is a, is a neat trick, isn't it? So you can have lots of different types of sprout growing in one little vessel. doesn't take up much room, either. No. That's my sales pitch for Yeah, it. yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it'll be available soon in the Wiggly catalogue. Now, what I want to do is find out what is bergamot. Because if you remember... We spoke about my favourite tea, which is Earl Grey, and we put out a little request. Does anyone know what bergamot was? Well, Michael reckoned he knew, but I've got an email from Kate Steele, and she says, Dear Wigglers, a bergamot looks like a lemon shaped like a pear, and I think a lemon crossed with a grapefruit. Strange but true, number two, is that sage is the main component of Cretan Mountain Tea, used as a digestive cure for colds, belly aches, and probably warts. <laughs> An all-round good tonic. Before the introduction of cheap whiskey, excessive meat, and 4x4s, the Cretans lived for a very long time. For one cup, 
Mix small amount of sage, some mint, cinnamon, cloves, infuse in hot water, add lots of honey, lovely jubbly and a good way to wake up in the mornings. And she says, have a lovely Christmas and thanks for the touch of English countryside for those of us who live in far away lands. Off to see my cabbage, Kate. Excellent. There we are. There we are. See, Michael was wrong. He said it was an orange. Well, don't take my word for it. <laughs> Try looking it up in some reference text. But... He says it's an orange. Well, we'll hear from you listeners, I hopefully. I said it was a South Italian citric fruit. You said orange. <laughs> like an orange. <laughs> it's more like an orange than a pear. Anyway. <laughs> so we'll hear from you, dear listener. Is it an orange or not? <laughs> What's coming up next week, Rich? I've got no idea. Lovely. Normally. I never know from one day to the next, <laughs> let alone planning a week ahead. Shall we say goodbye? Uh, yeah, shall we? Why not? Bye-bye. Bye. A bye from me.